What did she say? Start of chapter 43? Okay. Okay, start of chapter 43. My older brother and I cultivated a garden in a bare patch of land at the outskirts of the village. It was considered barren soil and no one else wanted it. Old Crab assigned it to us. We tilled the soil and enriched it with buckets of muck from our own sewer pool. My brother became an expert at spreading water and sewage over the little plot. After school each day, we tended it, and before long, we had the most productive garden in the village. An uncle, my mother's fourth brother, was an agronomist. He mailed his seeds of very sturdy vegetables from Tianjin. Our crops were huge compared to those of others. We grew turnips that were five pounds each. Yet before long, the largest turnips and bok choy began disappearing each night. Only when we cultivated crops around our home would the villagers not steal them. Those were growing on graves, and village superstitions and ghosts kept our crops secure. It was all so strange. The peasants were supposed to be the ones who understood agriculture. They had lived on this soil for hundreds of years. But within a few months, we were growing larger crops because we had better seeds and we knew how to care for the crops scientifically. They watched us and learned from us. The reverse of what was supposed to happen, happened. I was required to work in the fields every weekend as I grew older. One day I was spreading manure in the rice field with another girl when I became very tired. I felt faint and said I needed to go home. My friend said she was tired too. At the time our families needed the work points. When no one was looking, we threw manure in each other's hair, then announced we had to go home because of the accident and wash our hair. So we got the time off and the work points and headed home. I was 15 and growing increasingly impatient with village life. I skipped work many times and I was getting bored with school. Papa felt it might be a good idea for me to get out of the village for a short time. His uncle lived in Nanjing, the nearest large city. He was old and lived alone. Papa had learned by mail that he was not well. You can visit him, stay with him, and see the big city, Papa said. I was excited by the prospect. I took a bus to Nanjing. It was merely a truck with a canvas top. I crawled in the back where nearly 50 people were crammed inside, some sitting and some standing. I stood and hung onto a rack overhead. Four hours later, the bus stopped on the outskirts of Nanjing, where I transferred to a city bus. I found the old man in a dingy and dark apartment. It was a single room with a bed, a chair, and a table. He was in bed. Grand uncle, I'm Wu Yi Ma, he, I said. I am Wu Ning Kun's daughter. He learned that you were sick and he sent me here to visit you. Come in child, he said in a weak, wavering voice and motioned for me to approach him. I handed him a letter of introduction from my father. He read it and beamed. I have six children, he said, and no one has come to see me in a long time. I'm afraid I will die soon. I feel it in my bones. And now you're here. I'm happy to see you. He told me the wife of a friend in Nanjing came once a week to bring him food and to clean. He could no longer walk alone outside the apartment. He gave me a little money he kept hidden under his bed. He told me where a ne nearby market was and said I could buy us some fresh vegetables. He had a single electric burner and some pots. I got water from an outside faucet and prepared a vegetable soup for him. All the while I was cooking, he talked. I slept on the floor beside his bed that night. In the morning, I gathered up his dirty clothing and his bedding and washed them. I helped him sit on a stool near me so he could talk while I did the laundry. Then I hung everything on a line to dry in the sun. After dinner, he held my arm and I took him for a walk around the block. He had not been outside in months, he said. He loved the smell of the fresh air. I told him I could stay for only two days before returning home. He asked about my father and I told him about our life in the countryside. He showed concern. The next morning he wrote on an envelope a name and an address in Beijing. He folded a note and put it in the envelope. This is a letter to my daughter, he said. She's married to an influential man. Li Zhisui, her husband, is the private physician of Mao Zedong. He paused for the words to register. Maybe she can help your family. 
I cooked another meal for him, folded his clean clothes, and made his bed, and bade him goodbye. There were tears in his eyes when I left. I will never forget you, he said. You are a good-hearted girl. Mama had been trying for years to find a way for us to get out of the countryside. She and Papa discussed petitioning Anhui University to accept him back as a teacher. Mama was employed by the county and could not appeal to another work unit, but Papa had no unit, no organization to which he officially belonged. Only Mama could travel, however, to the places where she felt she might influence someone to transfer us from the countryside to the city again. Papa wrote up a long petition making his case. It said he wished to be rehabilitated politically and get his job and salary back in Hefei. Mama went to Hefei several times, carrying his petition. The travel expenses strained our budget, yet my parents thought it was worth the sacrifice. We must grab every opportunity to get out of here, Papa told us. When I arrived home, I described my stay in Nanjing to my parents and gave Papa the letter. He read it. He was delighted. This might be a ticket out, he said. It was decided that Mama would go to Beijing to appeal directly to Li Zhisui for help. She visited him in the middle of a blistering Beijing summer day. She shaped. She saved her bus fare and walked four miles to Li Zhisui's house from the residence of a cousin where she was staying. When she arrived, she was exhausted and thirsty. She knocked on the door and the wife of the physician, my father's first cousin, answered. Mother had seen her on several occasions in Beijing and recognized her right away. Their eyes met, but the woman showed no sign of recognition. Mama smiled and said, I am Wu Ningkun's wife. It's been a long time since I last saw you. The woman responded gruffly, and who is this Wu Ningkun? He's your cousin. We've met, Mama said. Don't you remember him? Don't you remember me? The woman stared at her coldly. I've never seen you before in my life, and I have no idea who Wu Ningkun is. You better go away. But you grew up in the same house. You played together in the same courtyard. You must remember. You're wrong. I don't know what you're talking about, the woman said. But your father is my husband's uncle. The woman's stare was icy and anxious, even frightened. My daughter cared for your father in Nanjing. She was there last month. He gave her your address. That's how I found you. I have a letter from him for you. More silence. Li Zhisui, Mao's private physician, appeared in the hallway behind his wife. My mother recognized him. Dr. Li, mother said, looking over the shoulder of his wife, I'm here to ask for your help. The physician said nothing. He stared at her with a combination of curiosity and alarm. Then he disappeared. Mama held out the letter, but the woman pushed it away. You should go, she said, before I summon security. Mama's spirits sank as she stood at the door. She fought back tears. May I have a drink of water? She said, I've come a long way to find you. It's hot and I'm thirsty. I think it'd be better if you just left, the woman said. Mama gave her a last look of desperation before she turned and walked away. End of chapter 43. Start of chapter 44. Mama did not give up. She came home from Beijing empty-handed, but she went back and forth to Hefei many more times, seeking help. She visited government officials and university administrators, making a case for my father's restoration in the university. The Anhui University officials expressed displeasure at her appeals and refused to invite him back. But then, almost miraculously, with the assistance of a few sympathetic figures in the provincial government who remembered and admired Papa, she learned of a vacant teaching position in Anhui Teachers University in the city of Wuhu. At the end of 1973, Papa was informed he'd been awarded the vacant position. My parents worked sl swiftly, completing the required paperwork for our move. Every document had to be signed and sealed by the entire county bureaucracy. Everything was finally completed three days before the spring festival began in February. We started packing. 
We used a small trunk Papa brought from the United States to carry some of our clothes. It was old and worn, but still serviceable. A faded Beijing address was painted neatly across the top of the trunk. One of Papa's friends at the University of Chicago, Li Tsung Tao, had written it on the trunk in July 1951. We stuffed the rest of our belongings in other trunks and bamboo baskets. I had mixed emotions about leaving. I'd had a good few, I'd had a few good experiences in Gaul Village, along with my many sad and tragic memories. In my spare time during the 15 days of Spring Festival, I visited the families of the friends I'd made. I took several pieces of candy to the shed of Little Rabbit's family and gave them to her brother, who was about five years old. Nobody mentioned Little Rabbit. I thought about visiting Chen Ying in Bao Village one more time, but I decided against it. I wasn't sure I'd be welcome. Instead, I visited her parents. I asked about Chen Ying. Her mother smiled from ear to ear and announced she had a boy. Please tell her I didn't have time to visit her before I left, but say I heard about her good fortune. Tell her how happy I am for her. Her mother nodded. I'll tell her. On the third day of the spring festival, I visited Jin Lan's parents. I wished them good fortune during the new year. Jin Lan's name was not spoken, and I didn't ask about her. Finally, I walked to the shed of Shui Zi's father. He was alone, preparing tea for himself. I entered his shed and wished him a happy new year. And the same to you, he said. Can you have a cup of tea with me? Of course, I said, surprised to be treated like an adult. I seated myself on a bench and he handed me a steaming cup of tea. We said nothing at first, but merely smiled and sipped tea. At last I asked, diffidently, how are Jinlan and Shui Zi? He gave me a look of surprise. Why do you ask me such a question? Because Jinlan is my best friend. I spoke with her before she ran away with Shui Zi. I know what they did. He looked into his teacup, unsure how to respond. He was silent for several seconds. You did a brave thing, I said. I admire you. He smiled, but still said nothing. Tell me, I said, did Jinlan have a boy or a girl? You know a lot, don't you, he said. Yes, I do. She had a boy, he answered, and she had a girl. It took a moment for me to grasp what he said. Twins, I asked. Yes, he said. He rose and went to his bed, reached into the pillowcase, and pulled out an envelope. He extracted a small photograph and handed it to me. In it, Jin Lan sat beside Shui Zi. Each of them held a baby. All four of them were bundled up in padded winter clothing. Jin Lan and Shui Zi were smiling. My eyes teared when I saw her. This is the second time I've ever known of anyone having twins, I said. It's wonderful. You must be very proud, Grandpa. He laughed. I am. As I stood to leave, he reminded me, This is a secret, Emal. No one in this village must know. I can keep a secret, I told him. Old Crab called on us during our last day in Gaul Village. He'd been drinking heavily. So, you're going to be city people, he said. You think you're flying out of my hand and going straight to heaven. We're going to miss you, Mama managed. Shit, he said and spat on her floor. You're glad to be leaving. When no one corrected his assertion, he added, Well, you have to give me a going away dinner tonight. And we have to have one last drink. Knowing he was still capable of causing problems for us, Mama agreed and asked him to return later. Early that evening, he was back wearing a clean shirt for the occasion. I'm thirsty, was the first thing he said upon entering our shed. Papa opened his last bottle of liquor and filled a cup for Old Crab, who emptied it in one swallow and thrust it out again. As he poured a second cup for the team leader, Papa asked, May we bring one of the doors with us? What for? Old Crab grumbled. Lumber is precious in the city, Papa said, and we can use it as a bed in our apartment. If you remember, you borrowed our other bed after we arrived here. I need all the doors, Old Crab said. And that settled it. 
After dinner, Mama and my brothers and I continued packing, but Father was required to sit at the table drinking with Old Crab and listening to him complain about work points and lazy peasants. Around midnight, Old Crab was too drunk to talk. The cigarettes and liquor were gone. He stood, staggered a few steps back, steadied himself, and said, I've got to be going now. Lots of work tomorrow. But before he departed, he circled the room, looking at what we were packing. He pulled back the cover on a basket and spotted my copy of David Copperfield. I need this for toilet paper, he snarled. He tucked the book under his arm and stumbled through the door. Seconds later, I heard voices outside, the voices of two men, angry voices. There was an exchange, a shout, and then it was quiet. One of the voices was Old Crab's. And I thought the other was Shreds' father. Did you hear that? I asked Mama. What? She said. We listened, but there was no sound. You're tired, Mama, she said. We have a long day ahead of us. Go to bed. The next morning, moving day, I rose early and went to our latrine. The flies were making an unusually loud hum. As I drew near the brick steps, I saw something white at the edge of the muck. I made out what appeared to be two bare feet protruding from the dark pool. I rushed back to our shed and told my parents what I'd seen. Mama ran to summon some of our neighbors. The word spread quickly of my ghastly discovery. Villagers came running. Some gasped and backed away. One of the women let out a long scream and dropped to her knees. Ji Kui came hobbling on his crutches. Two men grabbed the ankles and pulled the body out. It was horribly discolored, but by the clothing and the shape of the head, we could tell it was old crap. His body was stiff and black. Thousands of flies descended on the corpse as it lay beside the sewage pool. Old Crab's wife fell to her knees beside his body and howled. Ji Gui dropped his crutches and got down beside the body and slowly waved his little red book above his head, crying, Here, here, my papa will help you. My papa is the people's savior. My papa will make you well. The villagers stared at Ji Gui silently, almost as if they believed what he said, that the little red book could restore life. Mama helped Ji Gui stand and led him aside and whispered something to him. Because of her kindness toward him, he always listened to her. He nodded as she spoke and then went home chanting, Old Crab will be well. Chairman Mao is his savior. I noted my copy of David Copperfield, still clean, not far from Old Crab's body. I picked it up and concealed it from the others. As I pushed away from the crowd, I saw Shreds' father approaching. While everyone else was in shock, he was composed and unbothered. Old crab drowned in our shithole, I blurted out. I can't be certain of what I saw next because a ray of morning sunlight flashed over his shoulder and momentarily blinded me. But I'm almost sure he winked. Two men came to our hut a short time later and removed the doors to make a casket for old crab. Several hours later, a truck arrived to take us to Wuhu. Some of the villagers helped carry our belongings to the main road and assisted us in loading them. I climbed into the back of the truck with my brothers and looked at the village that had been my home for five years. I wanted to burn it into my memory for all time. The same strange sense of wonder went through me as when I'd arrived here from the outside world. Was it all real or had it been just a long nightmare? Could I be awakening at last? I saw several men crawling over the roof of our shed, throwing down bundles of straw and lumber for their own use. Look what they're doing, I said to Mama and pointed. Everything will be gone in an hour, she answered. As the truck pulled away, the villagers stood beside the road and watched us. Some waved. We waved back as they disappeared in the dust. An hour later, we arrived at the ferry dock. Our truck was the last one onto the ferry late that afternoon. As we crossed the Yangtze River, my brothers and I stood at the boat railing and looked at the other shore. The sun was setting behind us. The water shone like gold. None of us said a word. None of us looked back. End of chapter 44.